thanks to all for coming to this splendid conference. Thanks again to our communications and marketing department, in particular Andrea Larson, for all your hard work. Thanks to Dean Maureen O'Rourke for the financial support, to my colleagues in law and philosophy for their participation, and also to my colleagues from other institutions for their participation. Thanks most of all to Ronald Dworkin for the excellent book, the splendid presentation, and for your characteristically forceful and compelling defenses of your argument. Now, Professor Dworkin's keynote address began with his vision of heaven. And it looked something like a conference on justice for hedgehogs. Now, I don't know whether there's a heaven, but I do know it doesn't get any better than this. So. <laughs> Yesterday, Daniel Starr gave us some clever visual images of hedgehogs and foxes. And Ronnie spoke of his own hedgehog. Now, Linda and I want to be sure, Ronnie, that you really do have your own hedgehog. And this one, I think you'll find, is quite elegant and not at all prickly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I'll open it later, but it feels very cuddly, which is... It's fitting because I've, I've found these two days very cuddly. They had their, they had their moments. <laughs> but on the whole, I'm so grateful for this combination of uh, sharp, perceptive criticism and underlying affection. It, it pleased me very much. And I have to say, when I began uh, as Jim reminds you, I talked about my vision of heaven. I expected a lot, but I didn't expect anything as good as I got. So thank you all very much. Now, it falls to me to r respond to two of the conferences, uh, two of the sessions today. And I start with Ed Baker. I should say in advance that these are I found all the sessions, and I found this morning's sessions, very deep and broad. And I'm going to have to be selective in my response. I've seen some of the papers that will be published, and the papers are even deeper and broader than the 10-minute presentations were. And uh, I look forward to engaging with them. It's enormous help to me. Now, Ed Baker raised a number of questions. Among them was to question the transition that I make between a certain view of personal dignity and the basis of morality. That transition turns on a certain supposition that First, that you accept that your own life has objective importance, that it matters and not just to you how your life goes. And second, that it falls to you to identify how to make something valuable of it and then to pursue your conception. We talked uh, yesterday in a way I found very illuminating about whether this description of what dignity requires is simply too demanding, whether it, it suggests that many people lead lives which, in which they ought not to respect themselves. And I don't want that conclusion, obviously. I don't think what I said generates it, but I'm, I'm sensitive to that possibility. I suggest that if you have that view about your own life, then a question naturally arises. What is it 
about you that might suggest or provide a reason for thinking that though your dignity demands self-respect and authenticity, that is not true of everyone. There are at least some people of whom that is not true. What is it you could think that would justify that? Now, as Ed reminds us, people have answered that question to their satisfaction for centuries and still in many parts of the world. They answer that question to their satisfaction by saying, I belong to a particular faith, or that I am a particular ethnic stock, or that I am chosen by God who's chosen my people. There are many such answers, and I am not saying that you are logically compelled to reject them all. I simply, perhaps optimistically, though, though not here, think that you don't accept them and that they are extremely implausible. I do have an argument or two to buttress my feeling that they're implausible. I say it would be paradoxical to think, for example, that if you are wrong, as you might be, about your religion or your nationality, you have made a mistake about that, that it then doesn't matter or matters less how your life goes. I would think that when you apply this test to yourself, you would find that so far from that discovery letting you off the hook to try to live well, it has no effect of that kind. So, Ed, that is my argument, and you're quite right to say both that it doesn't, it's not logically compelled, and that not everybody has accepted it. I find it so plausible that I feel myself entitled to move on from that and accept what I call Kant's principle, which requires that you assume that what it is about you that is the basis of the importance of how you live and that is the basis of your personal responsibility is nothing more and certainly nothing less than your humanity and that once you accept that, you owe that to every that recognition to everyone else. Now, Ed also said, and I, I know something more about what he would say if he had more time because I've read his paper. He said that in his view, liberty on my account is too easily trumped. Perhaps since he didn't elaborate that, I should simply say that uh, I don't think that the examples he offers actually resound in my argument. He thinks I give inadequate protection to free speech, less protection than courts now give. So uh, to guard against that, let me describe the basis of the protection of liberty that I offer. I believe, I think I said something about this yesterday, but I, I believe that there are many sources of the protection of liberty encompassed in our First Amendment. One such source is democracy, and that, I believe, has two parts. I believe that democracy requires first that no one be stopped from presenting his opinion to the body politic, that that's a condition of the decision of the <coughs> body politic being coercively enforced against him. I believe it right to use coercion against individuals but only when they have had a voice, however detestable their opinions, in the decision that <coughs> has been taken pursuant to which they are coerced. So I think there is a citizen protecting function of free speech. But I also think that there is a 
an audience enabling or citizen enabling function of free speech. That is, no one in a democracy ought to be, in principle, deprived of hearing what anyone wants to say. And I think, put together, these justify at least as broad a protection of freedom of speech as the Supreme Court has historically recognized. However, I have to agree that in one respect, this argument is narrower than what the Supreme Court has done, and I very much fear in the next several weeks will do again, and that is confuse free speech with spending money to influence the result of the democratic election. Neither of the two principles that I described would justify the decision that I believe the Supreme Court is about to make, namely that the First Amendment protects corporations and allows them to spend as much money as they wish in political advertising during an election cycle. Ed also believes that we should emphasize political toleration, but not political neutrality. This is interesting because, as we'll see, some of the other speakers accused me of the opposite uh, tendency, which is to go too far in allowing the government to moralize or advocate distinct ways of life as preferable. So Ed, I think, take, is, has one concern, and others, uh, and I'll come to that, have another concern. I think the important thing is to distinguish between those acts of government that end in coercion and those acts of government that end in advocacy. I defend the right of government to co coerce people in order to protect the right view and when, as things work out in politics, the legislature's view, even if it's not right, on moral issues, issues of distribution of wealth through the tax system, for example, and the protection of one person from another. These are coercive acts. They're not morally neutral. Quite on the contrary, they're morally engaged. They're not tolerant. They're intolerant. When it comes to ethics, as distinct from morality, I take a different view. And that view distinguishes between advocacy and coercion so that my view of liberty requires that government not coerce when its justification for doing that is either its own or a majority's view about the right way to live, about the ways and how people have, have objected to that communitarian objection is very well known. But I don't, therefore, forbid government advocacy of ethical positions. As Jim Fleming reminds us, for a long time now, I have argued that it falls to government to remind people of their responsibility to take their own lives seriously in many ways. That's ethical advocacy, but I would be against a rule that forces people to attend lectures on the good life or lectures on how to live well. Now, <coughs> in, in Jim, Jim Fleming's remarks, which I found both sympathetic and probing, he raises exactly the question that I've just been discussing, 
and fears that my uh, newest description leaves more room for government moralizing. Once again, I want to emphasize the distinction between ethics and morality. I should say that the distinction is not all that easy to draw. I recognize that I put a lot of weight on it in this book, and perhaps I can do better in defining the distinction, but still that distinction is important in this, in this context. Because yes, I do believe, and I think for a very long time I believe, as long as I can remember, that government has a, a duty to moralize. It moralizes, of course, in its decisions as to the content of the criminal law. It moralizes when it tries to make its citizens less biased, less selfish. I believe that the campaigns to enforce the Civil Rights Act should include an attempt to address people as to the wrongness of discriminatory acts. I believe that the debate over health care led by the government should emphasize the responsibilities we have to each other as members of the same civil polity. So I do open the door to moralizing, but Again, the line between advocacy and coercion becomes important in the case, in many cases. I take a view which I believe is unpopular about hate speech. I take the view that the Supreme Court has on the whole defended. That's a view which outside America is very unpopular. Indeed, some people in this country find it a mistake. I think it's very important. It falls under the, what I think I call the citizen protecting democratic function of freedom of speech. But I don't think it follows that government may not moralize about the distasteful character of the opinions represented in hate speech. So I think there are two distinctions that are central to my discussions of all of this, and I continue to think are very important, just to repeat, the distinction between advocacy and coercion and the distinction between morality and ethics. Robin, <coughs> sorry. Robin West fears that the emphasis on rights, and particularly what she regards as the unfortunate metaphor of rights as trumps, has had bad effects in our society. She wishes me to bid only no Trump in the future. And perhaps that's good advice, but uh, metaphors, I agree, can be carried too far. Indeed, yesterday I began to think that metaphors about foxes and hedgehogs <laughs> had been carried rather far. However, when I look back over the recent history of our country, I don't find that Messrs. Bush and Cheney aired too much on the side of recognizing individual rights. I think, I think of anything, a little rights as Trump's would have been helpful in and about the White House during the past administration. So <clears throat> I, I also wonder whether the talk about rights, whether the image, I mean, I'm flattered to think that anybody with any power knows about rights as Trump's, but even if they did, I don't think that's responsible for the image of the Marlboro man, which has affected us, and I think for the worst. 
uh, since the Reagan days, the man on the horse. That isn't a case, I think, of people enjoying individual rights. I think it's much closer to the idea of the man free from ordinary limitations on other people. He sits tall in the saddle and he rides into Iraq when it pleases him. So I, I don't think that it's right to protest against the popularity of the idea of human rights. I continue to think, or political rights, individual rights, I continue to think that, that we suffer more from a failure to recognize these rights than from a recognition of them. And indeed, I think that Robin West really worries about recognizing the wrong rights. She talks about two examples. First, the regrettable decision of the Supreme Court in the Heller case, which has led, she believes, to more talk about rights to own guns than before. But she also talks about, in her view, deplorable spread of the idea of home education. And what she finds regrettable about that is the invasion of rights, rights of the children who are therefore deprived of a proper education, a democratic education. So I would, I would uh, accept what she says as a reminder that once we make talk of rights glib, that we fuel, we put power in the hands of people who have the wrong view about rights. But the remedy for that is to continue to argue about what the moral foundation of rights are. And we can't do that without, even if we don't use the phrase, even if we block the metaphor, we still have to talk about rights as trumps, in my view. Uh, Hugh Baxter also protests about too many metaphors in my arguments. And I take, I take this very much to heart. Metaphors are fun, and they can be, they can be misleading. Uh, I I really did mean, in spite of perhaps regrettable phrases like law flowing out of morality, I really do want to try and think about law as part of morality. And the important point about that, and perhaps embedding is the wrong word, but the point about that is that arguments about respecting law even when we find it distasteful should be seen as a kind of moral argument. These claims should be seen as making appeal to and therefore vulnerable to arguments about procedural morality, treating like cases alike having respect for what people have done in reliance upon what they expect the institutions to do supporting them. These are genuine moral arguments, and it's important to emphasize that they're moral arguments because that makes them, in my view, more sensitive to examination for too long, I think philosophers, legal philosophers, who want to think about the impact of morality on law have confined their attention or directed most of their attention to the substantive provisions of law and failed adequately to recognize that the constitutional structure is not fixed as a background. Constitutional, institutional structure 
is not fixed as the background within which we have to argue about the impact of morality on the content of law, but the constitutional structure itself is a commitment which has to be defended and inspected from the point of view of morality. That, it seems to me, would be a helpful change. We'd, we would ex extend, if we could do that, we would extend the impact of philosophical thinking about law beyond the First Amendment, the Fifth and the Fourteenth. And we would extend that thinking to such matters as the doctrine of precedent, stare decisis, original intention, and the rest of what we take to be part of a different and more procedural structure. I, <clears throat> I'm very grateful to Linda McCain for telling us about the book, The Eloquence of the Hedgehog. I look forward to reading it. I have two hopes. First, that it's carried in the airport shops. <laughs> and second, if not, that it's on Kindle. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Uh, <clears throat> Now, Robert Bone took up questions of procedure, and he spoke in a way that I find congenial, given what I just said about the importance, put it in a shorthand way, of moralizing questions of procedure. Uh, he's right that I've tried to do that long, long ago, and I think He's right that we need to spend more attention uh, on that. He agrees with me that there's a special kind of harm when the wrong result is reached in a criminal case, and that the fact that this is a special kind of harm that can't be captured in an economist's cost-benefit calculation affects how we should think about criminal procedure. He doubts that we have the same reason for worrying about civil procedure. I understand what he means. The social condemnation involved in a mistake in a contract case or a tort case, a regulation case, is certainly less than it is in most criminal law cases. But I continue to think that the moral condemnation is greater in some civil cases than it is in some criminal cases. I do think that the, there is a condemnation implicit in the judgment, first that someone has broken a contract or been negligent to the serious cost to someone else, and has not recognized this and settled as, as he should have done. Or perhaps another party has been wrong in pursuing the matter, the plaintiff has been wrong in pursuing the matter in the courts. I don't accept Oliver Wendell Holmes's view that we should treat all of this as simply a price mechanism, including the litiga litigative side of it. I do think there are social condemnations. I also think that in some criminal cases, for example, those adjudicating some technical point in the about the enforceability of the parking or traffic regulations, the moral condemnation in finding the defendant guilty is not very serious. So I would rather extend this, if you like, moralizing of the procedural part of our legal practice. I'd like to extend it across the boards 
and take into account the seriousness of the condemnation, the degree of moral harm in distinctions, in types of cases, cases in which a higher degree of protection against error is merited, but I wouldn't like that simply to track the distinction between criminal and civil law. Sam Friedman has given us, I think, a, a very serious and deep, thoughtful consideration of the connection between justice, price, and opportunity cost. He's raised questions about my own arguments in these matters that I haven't seen before, and I'm very grateful for them. Uh, <clears throat> he begins by saying that a market can do three things for us. It can allocate resources efficiently. It can set prices effectively. And it can then serve as a mechanism for the distribution of the proceeds of those two prior activities and that we ought to detach the third function from the first two. And he gives examples in which the third function does seem to be distinct. Wilt Chamberlain gives some of his huge earnings. It, it, perhaps it's time to, to replace Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> I used to talk about Ted Williams, but I think... <laughs> Uh, who is it now? Kobe somebody. <laughs> uh, Kobe gives some of his huge fortune to his mother, and that does not, that, that doesn't seem to raise questions about opportunity cause, because of course it doesn't change prices. But, as far as I can see, distribution of the proceeds of economic activity does change prices. And since it change price, changes prices, it changes the costs that people pay and changes the way in which, or I would prefer to say the degree to which what people pay reflects the true opportunity cost of what they get. It seems to me that Sam has raised the following important question, parallel to questions that have come up over these two days, question about the connection between dignity and wrong, for example. Sam raises the question of the connection between responsibility and justice. He says, yes, people should pay the opportunity cost of what they have. That is, by opportunity cost, I, we mean the cost to others, what others give up in my having what I have. We should think about this issue by first deciding what a just distribution is like, and then saying people should take responsibility for paying the costs that are fixed, the prices that are fixed by a distribution <clears throat> matching what we independently think to be a just economic and social arrangement. Uh, I realize that I'm thinking in the other direction. That is, I want the question of bearing, taking responsibility, bearing the right share of the costs, to be a question that figures in the decision what arrangement would be just. So I have tried to construct an idealized, formulaic account of economic distributive justice that I believe makes the question of opportunity cost basic. And it goes like this. We think of the absolutely idealized 
uh, structure as one involving two steps. First, an auction of the basic resources which are found, transformed into abstract form, an auction in which the opportunity cost is exactly measured by the auction. People have equal bidding resources. The envy test is met. And each person has indeed, at that moment, the true cost of what others give up. And then we, we follow that stage with a second stage in which people assess risks and buy insurance against risks. And once again, a market fixes what that insurance costs. It fixes it against competitive uses of the resources and competitive demands on risk insurance. So at, throughout this stage, one can say, here we have not opportunity costs as derivative from an independent judgment about what justice requires, but opportunity costs from a base of equality, which we can, citing equality, declare to be true opportunity costs, and then try and construct an actual real world system which takes this two-stage process as ideal. Now, imagine uh, something like the Kobe Bryant example. We have someone not very well off at all, someone who clearly belongs, however the economic classes are divided, in the worst off class. And there's a high tax system, capital gain tax system, in his community. And he points out that if the tax were lower, medicine he needs would be cheaper. Why? Because investment in pharmaceuticals would be encouraged by a lower capital gain tax and therefore, with higher investment and more production in the pharmaceutical industry, the drug he needs would be cheaper. Or perhaps the drug isn't produced at all, or the research isn't carried out at all. He's sick, and he's economically uh, badly off. And he says, I would be better off if the tax system were more lenient and more encouraging to investment. Now, what reply may we give to him? Can, I think, on a structure designed in the way I'm trying to defend, we can say to him, you have your fair share, because if the tax were lower, then it wouldn't model the true cost to others of what you have. It's regrettable that you don't have what you want, medicine or basketball entertainment or whatever else it is. It's regrettable that you don't have this, but this is the result of dividing all the resources of the community so that each one has what others, each one has the same measured by what others give up. Now, suppose instead of that answer, we say to him, it's regrettable, but this is what follows from arranging the institutions uh, of our economy in such a way as to make the worst off class as, as well off as it can be. He then says, but you have, I'm a member of the worst off class, and you have made me worse off than I can be. And it seems to me that we haven't given him as effective an answer. He can say this result shows that uh, the basis of your argument about justice isn't, isn't satisfactory to me. I think I'd, you know, it is a choice. I'm, not, I'm just trying to clarify why I think that the notion of true opportunity cost 
rather than opportunity cost derivative from a just system whose justice is defended in some other way has advantages. I won't convince you, but uh, <clears throat> that seems to me that you have the, the issue that you have isolated. Uh, <clears throat> now, Frank Michaelman raises really an interesting issue, an interesting substantive issue cloaked in an exegetical one. And the exegetical one is how shall we understand uh, the debate such, it is, such as it is between Isaiah Berlin and myself about liberty. First, there's the question, interesting one, about whether Berlin thought that when values conflict, there's, there's a proper choice between them, but the proper choice leaves something to regret because something of value has been denied. Or whether, on the contrary, he thought that when values conflict, you, you pays your body and you takes your choice, that any society must simply choose and there's no basis for the choice. My own view, trying to recollect what I've read and, and conversations, my own view is some of both. I think there are places in which the tragic choice idea seems to emerge from the text and other places. I think it emerges more clearly in the grand rhetorical occasions, like, for example, an inaugural lecture at Oxford and that in other kinds of writings it emerges differently. But these are questions of, of interpretation. Now, <clears throat> Frank, coming to a more substantive issue, Frank believes that I think that freedom, as distinct from what I call liberty, must be a value in itself, because whenever freedom is limited, then government must account for itself with a justification for limiting freedom. It may be that the government has a perfect justification for speed limits, but it needs a justification in my account. Now, I want to say two things in reply. First, that to the degree of which, in which that is true of coercive measures, it's true of all government action. It needs a justification. I think even the choice of a state bird might need justification. I mean, if a state said, our justification is, a, I mean, our, sorry, our state bird is a crow called Jim, that would raise substantial substantial problems that it would have to account for itself. Uh, but certainly when government decides to build a highway or an airport, even on its own land, it has to have a justification for why it chose that place, thereby disrupting the lives of these people rather than other people. The distinction that I think important is one captured in constitutional law in the distinction between the kind of justification that's needed. The kind of justification that's needed for a traffic law is called, with, in my view, tongue-in-cheek, bare rationality, which means uh, any, almost anything will do provided it's not discriminatory, dishonest, corrupt, or insane. <laughs> Anything will do. And then those cases in which what government is required to show is a compelling justification and also to show that what is justified is narrowly tailored, as the phrase goes, just to serve the purpose for which that justification, that compelling justification, is available. Now, my view is that not every 
case of limiting freedom requires a compelling justification, heightened scrutiny. I'll know on the contrary. I think that most cases of limiting people's freedom demands only a rationality justification and demands no stronger a rationality justification than the decision to put a highway or an airport where it will discommode some people. Now, <coughs> Robert Sloan raises very important questions about my suggestions on the topic of human rights. He says that he's surprised at the use I make of the idea of sovereignty. I make that use in attempting to distinguish human rights as a class of political rights. Just as I worry about something we discussed yesterday, distinguishing legal rights from political rights, I'm also concerned about the distinction, uh, about the latter distinction. And I suggest that we carry over the trumping metaphor. The trumping metaphor simply indicates a standard that we ought to reach, bear in mind in deciding what rights we have. And I'm suggesting that in the case of human rights, it would make sense to take the standard to be this. We identify a human right by asking the question, would this invoke what has come to be called the responsibility to protect, meaning the responsibility to protect citizens against their own government. Now, I use the word sovereignty because I believe sovereignty has been associated with the right of self-determination. I'm not using sovereignty, and perhaps I should change that word. I think it might be a good idea to change that word. But I'm supposing that there are cases in which government acts in a way, including our own government, that we think violates the true rights of citizens. But the case doesn't rise to the level where the world community or powerful nations would be justified in using sanctions, economic sanctions, for example, or in the extreme invasion, military force, to correct that situation. I give in the book the example. The United States is very widely thought around the world to be in violation of people's rights because it uses capital punishment. But I don't think it would be right, though, though I want to say, yes, I agree with that. I, it would not be right for other nations to invade Florida or even though it's a harder case, Texas. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Robert gives the example of healthcare. And I think that's really a good example. We have, I believe, a political right to healthcare and people in countries that can afford it, also have a right to health care. I don't believe that it rises to the level at which even economic sanction would be justified. Now, we need an argument as to, I mean, that's the formal distinction, that's the standard we have to meet. What argument could we should we engage in, in order to see whether that standard is met. And it's at this point that I invoke the idea of a good faith conception of what it is to treat people as equals and what it is to respect their responsibility for their own lives. Not the right conception, which would include health care, but a good faith conception which might deny health care. That, it seems to me, is an appropriate standard to use. And I try and capture this by saying 
People have a basic human right to a certain attitude on, be, uh, on the side of those who propose to exercise power over them. They have a right to be treated by those people with a certain attitude, but that falls. They also have a right to the correct realization of that attitude, but that is a right. These are different rights, and only the first should be recognized as a human right. Now, Robert says, this yields a vague standard. Yes, it does. I'm not proposing this standard as a substitute for international covenants and conventions on human rights, certainly not. We need the Helsinki Accords, for example. We need the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but we have to engage in argument as to what should be on that list, and I'm proposing something admittedly about which people will disagree, though they'll disagree less about what the right conception is. I'm not attracted by the alternate suggestion that Robert makes of an overlapping consensus. That would produce the wrong result, for example, on the place of women in society and the extent to which they can be victims of discrimination. The least common denominator would be the result, and in the world that we have, the least common denominator, I believe, would fail the standard I use. Now, in the case of Stephen Mesita, I don't know whether he's still here, but I wish to say, rarely have I been so totally convinced <laughs> as I was by my learned friend, the right honorable member for Princeton. <clears throat> Jeremy. <laughs> I'm not as persuaded. Uh, first, what the lifeboat example aims to show. I don't, I'm not sure what it, that it's a knockdown argument against much, but it's a good argument against something, and I want to try and clarify what it is. I said I wanted to show that uh, majority rule or majority decision, as you prefer, is not intrinsically fair. Now, I should have distinguished, and now do, between two meanings. One is that it's always fair in the sense of being a default, uh, something which, if you don't use, you better have a good reason for not using. It's the, it's the default, it's what is just in the very nature of the case false. Lifeboat example refutes that claim, I believe. The, I think, I think you suppose that I meant to show that majority decision is never fair, and I don't think that. It is sometimes fair. The question is when, and we need an argument to show that it's fair. And I think in the political context, as Stephen said, the argument is very complex, and the best argument will be one that uh, first more precisely defines what the majority decision means, helps us to see whether proportional representation, for example, super majorities and so forth. The phrase majority decision is too vague to do much work by itself. Helps us to see which conception is appropriate, and it helps us also to see what place majority decision suitably uh, made more precise, should play in an overall governmental structure. And I think Stephen has reminded us very ably of, the, of the, all the kinds of considerations that uh, go into that decision. About your amended procedure in the lifeboat, the, the uh, members, the, the passengers no longer vote as to whether they should vote. They now have a menu and there are certain choices on the menu, but it 
strikes me as important and revealing that among the choices on the menu is no longer majority decision. That's been taken off the menu, and it's been taken off because they recognize that that's not fair. Now, one thing that's been left on the menu also strikes me as unfair. Under certain circumstances, if it's very dark, it might be fair. But if it's not all that dark, it might be evident that there's a small group of people who are candidates for being very unhealthy people. And everyone who's not in that group will have a reason for voting that that test should be used. In that case, I don't think it should be on the menu. I think we're down to the lottery again. Now, maybe there are some, uh, some other things that could be put on the menu. But this seems to me to underscore the fact that, as I put it just now, uh, majority decision is not a default. It's simply a candidate. And in some cases, it's obviously bad candidate. And whether that's so in the political uh, arena very much depends on the demography of that political uh, community. Now, for what might, might be in Jeremy's life an historic moment, Jeremy says that he's waited for, what, 20 years for anyone to say why the Supreme Court should decide cases five to four. I'm going to try. <laughs> As I just said, it's always a question what procedures would be best. In many cases, there are a number of, of possibilities. In the political case, as more and more nations are coming to recognize, some form of judicial review is on the menu. Majority rule is not the appropriate standard, nor is it recognized the appropriate standard, for the judicial system as a whole. We have appellate courts, and we have a hierarchy of courts. And it must often happen, particularly on review, by the Supreme Court of an en banc proceeding in an appellate court that 20 judges have voted one way and five voted the other, and the five win because they're on the Supreme Court. When you come to the Supreme Court itself, I mean, in that case, you might say, the circuit courts of appeal don't have majority rule because they have majority rule subject to judicial review, judicial review by the Supreme Court of the lower court. Now, when you come to the highest court, one thing isn't available, namely judicial review. There are other things that are available. I believe there are some courts that give the chief a tie-breaking vote. There is, in our Supreme Court, the chief has an enormous power, namely the power to choose who writes the majority opinion. That's a great power. I don't know of any suggestion has ever been made that the justices should vote to see which of them, or the justices on the majority side should vote to see which of them. So my answer to the question is, uh, there are very few options by the time you get to the Supreme Court. Judicial review isn't on the menu, and of the options that are, there seem to be very good reasons to use majority rule. But since judicial review is available for the community as a whole, the situations are not parallel. I think I'm at the end. <laughs> uh, question. Oh. Thank you. Now. Yes. I wondered if I could invite you to return to the sovereignty issue raised by Robert Sloan. Mm -hmm. uh, as with most of the backbenchers in the room, I have only a, a thin knowledge of the emerging book that you're still revising. Um, I've learned a lot about it from the comments of the panels, and I have uh, not yet absorbed 
copy of the manuscript. And it seems to me that the, the first uh, three parts are pretty much universal to hedgehogs everywhere. Um, but that as you move into politics and the relationship between law and politics that, that ultimately forms justice for hedgehogs, uh, that it, it, it doesn't scale very clearly uh, to hedgehogs everywhere, uh, especially in terms of a, a governmental entity's duty of equal concern and respect. And, and I'm, I, I never thought that John Rawls sufficiently jumped borders uh, with his theory of justice, and I'm wondering if you would venture whether you have any intention to jump borders with yours, and, and if so, what kind of, of duty of equal concern and respect an international governing entity would owe uh, to citizens around the world? I'm working on it. I, I'm, uh, I've committed to give a lecture in November on that subject, and I hope that that will be my next project. What, what I, so I don't want to say very much about it because anything I say now I'll take back uh, Where's the lecture? in London. The, it does seem to me that the argument that is in Justice for Hedgehogs, uh, which uh, about political obligation, our duty towards each other as fellow citizens, uh, lays heavy emphasis on the fact that we participate and are victims of coercive uh, enforcement of law. It's because we are bound to and subject to and govern over each other that we have that, I think, special responsibilities to each other. Now, what is happening in the international sphere seems uh, to me strikingly new over, let's say, the, half century, the last half century, and strikingly in the direction of international organizations exercising coercive authority over large numbers of people in various ways. The most dramatic is when NATO or the United Nations authorizes war on a nation. If there's ever an example of coercive authority, that's it. And I therefore think that we must begin to think in extending the responsibilities, perhaps beginning with the development uh, of an economic side to the role of international organizations, that is, clarifying at once which organizations have the power to license coercion, and then think about the composition of those entities and the responsibility of those entities. I think that there's uh, for example, there's a, an opportunity in that story for the development of international law. In our own federal system, law, inter, uh, national law developed, this is before the terrible mistake in Erie Railroad and Tompkins, national law developed by a sense that the various states were, were united and becoming more and more integrated with power over one another, exercised through the national government, and that this ought to be matched by a common law, applying, treating everyone as equal from the standpoint of the law of the nation. This was the doctrine of Swift and Tyson. Uh, that great legal positivist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, put a stop to that in the taxi cab case. And I think that was a, that was a mistake. Now, one, this is only one of the dimensions uh, of thought invited by your question, but I think we might see a parallel development in international law coming as a common law 
arising as a, the idea of a common law of treating people with basic rights, arising out of the fact that as communities, we, I mean, as individual nations, we unite ourselves in communities, and as communities license force of various kinds against some people, that has to mean that we have to coordinate the legal structures through which we do that, emerging towards a common law of human rights. Uh, that's more than what you asked for, but I'm simply exhibiting how early the stages are of my thinking about this. <laughs> Thank you. I tried. Yes. Thanks. I have, a, I think, a clarificatory uh, question that in some ways builds off uh, Frank Michaelman's uh, statement and your response to Frank. What I think I don't understand is that at various points in your argument, you invoke the term coercion as if it is one with enormous significance. It matters whether the government is coercing. Uh, and then Frank says, uh, doesn't the fact, if you want to talk about coercion, you've got to talk about coercion against a baseline. What's the baseline against which you would measure coercion? Frank says, isn't it total freedom? Uh, and so if total freedom is the baseline against which we measure coercion, and if there is something especially troublesome about coercion that I took to, sing to signal special justification was required, uh, then doesn't total freedom have some significance? Or, alternatively, don't you have to stop saying there's something special about coercion? Well, I, th I want to make a distinction between the power to coerce and the rightful use of that power on particular occasions. I think our responsibility to one another comes out of our title to coerce. And we exercise that title sometimes wrongly. Nevertheless, and this is part of the notion of political obligation, we claim people have a moral duty, except in ex very exceptional cases, to do what we collectively say. That's the power to coerce. And I think simply having that power carries with it respon reciprocal responsibilities of concern and, and respect. Uh, it's, to my mind, a different question of what level of justification you need in order to uh, justify any particular act of coercion. I think those are independent questions. And as to the second, I have said uh, normally you need only that it's not idiotic or irrational or discriminatory, uh, and you leave nothing to regret. That's part, part of it, you leave nothing to regret. But if you claim the power and you do not treat people as equals in the process through which that power is directed, then I think you've done them harm. Frank is shaking his head. Perhaps I can see that all the way up here. Perhaps you'd like to continue the discussion. Um, the question um, that I think Dick was pressing you with and that I mean to be pressing you with is it's partly why coercion figures as a matter of special sensitivity. My suggestion uh, was because occasions of coercion are always in a, in a distinctive way, potentially uh, occasions on which uh, dignity, dignity uh, as 
uh, you conceive of dignity um, might suffer an insult, either by reason of deviation from the principle of equal concern or by reason of deviation from the principle of respect for responsibility, right? Uh, and that uh, there's implicit in this way of thinking an attribution of value to agency, choice, self-direction, which is another way of attributing value to <coughs> freedom, it seems to me, which isn't erased by pointing out that and why um, uh, various restrictions on freedom may be justified. There's still, there's still this predicate uh, uh, idea of a particular kind of justification. I'm not talking now about the degree or intensity of justification, but a particular kind of justification that's called uh, into play whenever freedom is restricted. Uh, if, you, if you put someone in jail, you harm that person. It's the harm or the threat of harm that counts in this calculation. If I harm you in various ways, not just imprisoning you and not just assaulting you, if I harm you in various ways, I have done something wrong. That is the thesis of the fourth part of the book. I've done you some, I've done a wrong by doing you harm. When we collectively threaten or do you harm, we potentially, we're potentially doing a wrong because harming is a wrong. Therefore, we need a justification for harming you. Our justification is that we have done this through a process in which your dignity is protected in certain ways. Now, in my view, this is entirely parallel to harming you in other ways. As I say, by building an airport, which we can only do collectively, through the power of eminent domain, for example, next to you, uh, not far from your house. That's a harm. We need a justification for that. It's the power to impose harm on you. I don't count, as I said earlier in a different part of the discussion, I don't count telling you that you ought to act responsibly as harming you. But I do count threatening you or putting a nuisance near you as harming you. Now, what you were, I think, raising when you say you always need a justification for coercion or, yeah, uh, my, respi my reply to that is you always need a justification for any collective action that harms you. That is not a special, that does not require a threshold in the, that liberty does. That again, just using the language that you are more familiar with than I am, the distinction between the rationality test and heightened scrutiny of some kind. So my claim is that we do have a distinction between freedom and liberty and that it's enforced in constitutional law through the various obnoxious levels of heightened scrutiny. I'm going to raise a general question, Ron, about, um, about values here. Uh, and. Uh, 
you in Berlin and pluralism and all that sort of thing and see if I got straight on how the argument about these things went uh, this weekend. Um, let, me put it, uh, let me put it this way. Um, in answer to those who talked about incommensurable values, you, it seems to me, made the right point uh, in saying that if there's a dispute about values between people, uh, one can't just assume that the values are incommensurable. It may just be that they don't know the right answer. Yeah. And what I want to get clear about is the connection between your insisting that there is a right answer, uh, in other words, uh, the unity uh, or the unitariness of value, uh, and the question, yes, the question about whether there is a right answer and the unitariness of value. Uh, uh, it seems to me that those two can be separated. I agree with you about the idea that in disputes, one can and certainly should go through with feeling there is a right answer. But it doesn't follow from that that there are no incommensurable values. Because no. the right answer might be that there are in incommensurable values. Yes. Uh, and so I wonder just how you see the relationship between those two things. Well, I see it as you've described it. Uh, oh, so you're all right with uh, incommensurable values then? Well, I, <laughs> uh, I'm not, I, as you point out, I <clears throat> argue that claims of incommensurability and allied claims, because that incommensibility is only one example, uh, require the same kind of argument in their favor as claims that there's a right answer. The default position is uncertainty, not as I think many people assume, uh, some form of skepticism about there being a right answer. Skepticism is just another view, as you just put it, about what the right answer is. Uh, but I, I recognize that there may be arguments, the best argument may be, and I tried to give some examples in the chapter on interpretation uh, about different ways of reading a poem and different, particularly a case I find, an example I find persuasive, different ways of producing a classic on the stage. Now, <clears throat> the question of the unity of value seems to me independent for exactly the reason you give. The quest my argument for independence of value is not that there's uh, something about a right answer, the, I'm sorry, for the unity of value. It's uh, a rather long argument about the, what, how we should understand the character of truth in these domains that we should not think of bare truth as available. Therefore, we should aim to make as comprehensive an interrelationship of mutual support among our values as is possible to achieve. As I said yesterday, uh, in response to, I thought, a very good, very good argument, uh, we're unlikely in any lifetime, or indeed over culture, we're unlikely fully to succeed. So we will find ourselves with concepts not fully integrated. By integrated, I mean, don't produce conflicts. You define kindness to someone in such a way that telling him the truth is a kindness, or at least not an unkindness. But we might not be able to to see our way to accept that. It might not be that we can actually believe it. In which case, we will say, so far as we can now see, we don't yet have a way of integrating these. Maybe we never will. And still these have a use for us. And perhaps the thing to say at the present time is, at the stage of, of thought that we've reached, <laughs> conflict conflicts with honesty on this on this occasion. Now, as you say, 
That doesn't exclude the possibility. There's a right answer to the question, okay, what should you do? Uh, I wanted to follow up on the exchange and the response to uh, Jim Fleming. Uh, so I heard you say uh, quite clearly that uh, you agree that when it comes to the state acting in its non-coercive capacity, that there's nothing, that it, indeed it should uh, promote uh, certain values of morality, so it should condemn hate speech at the same time that it protects it, for instance. But I was wondering what you, what, when it comes to not the questions of morality, but what you, what you call ethics, in particular conceptions of the good, such, such as the kind of reflection on, uh, or self-reflection that you think is important to a good life, whether that's, there's also a role for the state there in promoting uh, that, that kind of reflection. And if you do think that not just morality, but also ethics should be promoted and a particular conception of the good, I wonder what you say to the traditional liberal worry that that's not showing respect for persons' ability to formulate their own conceptions of the good life and to pursue them. And then a related, I think, question too comes from the question of coercion. I'm wondering in the kind of quasi-coercive instances anyway, I'd call them, uh, when it comes to, for instance, incentives or state financing, whether you think there's a role there too uh, in either promoting morality uh, or y the conception of ethics that you, that you sketch. Um, thanks. <coughs> These are both very interesting questions. I think that the advocacy of ethics should be an advocacy of the basic principles. And I, I do believe, and Jim pointed this out about my argument about abortion, I do believe it's a proper role of government to say, your life is important, think, think carefully about what you're doing with it. Now, uh, whether the government can say, and the right thing to do with it, is to read the classics before you do anything else. Uh, that would seem to me a practical contradiction of the teaching, that's your responsibility. Now, I'm not sure about that. I'm, you know, uh, To make available examples, the whole, the, the long and en endless argument about the content of public, mandatory public education should it be to hold out examples of worthy lives? Well, perhaps to some extent it should be. But, but the quasi-coercion that you speak of must always be subordinated to government emphasizing that that's your responsibility. And I think there can be a practical conflict. And I think that accounts for, at least in my case, accounts for the liberals' hesitation and reluctance to approve uh, advocacy about how to live. Advocacy about morality seems to me an entirely different story. I think the opposition to the hatred between races is something that is very much the government's business. And the government, it, it's a means to protect people. And I see no objection, as long as it's not an invasion of speech. Oh, I was very interested in the distinction that you drew between- um, I'm sorry, right could here. you hold up a hand? Oh, yes, thank you. I was uh, very interested in the distinction that you drew between political rights and human rights. Yes. I took it uh, that you meant that uh, human rights are a narrower category than political rights. So yes. for example, there might be a political right to healthcare, but not a human right. Yeah. And the reason is because human rights play a very distinctive role in political argument. Um, if there's a violation of human rights, then um, other states or the international community would be justified in intervening in the offending state through um, coercive means such as economic intervention yeah. or their limit uh, military invasion. But I'm wondering if that is too narrow conception of the purposes of human rights. So for example, one might argue that another purpose is to justify positive assistance. So if a uh, state's unable to provide for the health care of its inhabitants, then that could justify, as a human right, positive assistance from other countries to help that state. 
Or another function might be that it could be a standard of internal criticism, yeah. such as when the Soviet dissidents used the Helsinki Accords to criticize the behavior of the Soviet Union. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my, as I, I should have made clearer, this count is both functional and formal. I'm setting a standard that we ought to meet before we claim a human right. Now, if we say there isn't a human right to health care because we wouldn't be justified, the international community wouldn't be justified in sanctioning nations that didn't provide it, you worry that this will tend to lower the level of concern, lower our obligations to help other nations provide health care. I think that's a good example of the, what, what might be called the debasing of rhetoric. Because if we have to say people have a human right to health care in order to justify sending aid to countries so they can provide it, we're mixing, I think we're mixing up two things. Urgent need, what nations ought to do. I think it's enough to call those political rights. One thing that is debased, every time we introduce another level, then we have to say, well, this is a human right. The European Union has declared that people have a human right to be free from genetically engineered tomatoes. That's, that's a very bad mistake. Uh, it's a, it would also be a mistake to have, say they have a right to be free from genetically uh, engineered or modified vegetables. I think what we should say is, these aren't good for you. <laughs> or, or they aren't good for the planet. Both of those I happen to think are false, but that's what, that's what we should say. And to start talking about rights seems to me some analog of Gresham's law. We'll soon be calling them human rights. Then we'll be calling them basic human rights. So I would rather set the threshold rather high, but not to say if it's not a human right that it's nothing to worry about. Ed, yes. Is the mic here? Just pressing on the question back there, as a, a good Texan, I'm appreciative of my state having equal concern for me and distributing my equal share of the wealth. But then I was disturbed when they wanted to take some of it to support a public library, not for children, yeah. which may be special, but for adults, where the library only had books uh, showing that a true man either plays football or carries a gun. Do I have a legitimate objection other than that I should pursue my views politically? You you object to the museum being built and certainly with my taxes. Yes, stocked with your tax money. Uh, I I've said in the but, book, but but maybe even them having such a a, a library. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I, I, I both object Mr. to them. Mr. Mellon gives them the money, and you say they should turn it back. Well, either way, I don't yeah. want them advocating that conception of the good, yeah. and I don't want them using, I feel like I'm being coerced when they take my money to do it. I, <clears throat> in the, among these very difficult distinctions, I distinguish between ethics, how to live, and what's valuable, what's intrinsically valuable. And I do think, these are all you know, very hard to uh, defend in any way that's going to convince people who start off not believing it. But I do think that we as individuals and we collectively have an obligation to encourage and protect what is good. Not good for us. And not good because there's a way of living, you know, that gets you into the museum by 9.30 every morning. But good because it is part of a heritage, a tradition uh, of excellence. Now, I could go on 
and this would be very artificial indeed, and try and connect the protection of things beautiful or wonderful in themselves to our ethical responsibility to make our life a work of art. But I won't dare yet press that particular view, though I believe it. But just that government has a responsibility, and we through our government have a responsibility to protect our great forests, to protect our art, to encourage its new production, to protect endangered species, though perhaps not all of them. These are things that fall under the heading of that which is good. And I believe, I don't think there's any insult to dignity to tax people and to make collective decisions about what is good. Because this isn't a decision about how the is, isn't a decision that limits your responsibility, provided its taxes are fairly raised, limits your responsibility to decide for yourself how you should live. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about interpretation. So in, in the second part of the book, you draw a distinction between, there's, there's actually three parts, but I just want to ask you about two of them, between a, a collaborative interpretation and conceptual interpretation. So collaborative interpretation assumes some, some sort of antecedent author to whom the interpreter is subordinate in a way, whereas in conceptual interpretation, each participant in the interpretive enterprise is sort of both the author and the interpretive uh, and the interpreter. The the concept sort of belongs to the appropriate interpretive community. Yes. Um, so I see I see that distinction. But then you said this comment that I, I found puzzling. You said that legal interpretation almost always is seen as a collaborative as collaborative interpretation, which yes. struck me as odd because it seems to me that the idea of law as integrity uh, sees law as a, as a common project where integrity marks a kind of Protestant attitude for. Uh, uh, for, for judges, but also I think for citizens. There are parts of law's empire that point in that direction. So my question for you is, when is law, uh, w I mean, so maybe, it, maybe it's just a throwaway comment, so I'd like to hear more about when law is the first kind and when it is the second kind, but I also wanted to maybe suggest that might we think that the proper author of law, I mean, I guess in scare quotes, is in fact the community speaking with one voice, uh, with integrity, property, and innocent. But uh, I'd just like to hear what you Yes, no, that's very interesting and important, and I should be careful with that. Uh, it, would be, it would be more strictly correct, but maybe too limited, if I said that statutory interpretation is collaborative. It's really what I have in mind. But maybe too limited, because common law interpretation, uh, you might say, is also collaborative because we can identify enough who the people who made it were, and they're a group of people, judges, uh, administrative officials, and so forth. But there's a large part, I agree with you, there's a large part of legal interpretation that is moral interpretation. I was speaking earlier about procedural, the procedural part of law being open more open than it has been to uh, an inspection of its moral credentials. Well, that would be to bring to bear honesty, fairness, uh, respect for reliance. It would bring together a lot of ideas which are formed collectively. They have to be continually interpreted and interpreted by particular people but what is being interpreted is a moral tradition. So I, you're right to say I should be more discriminating. How would you apply that to the uh, interpretation uh, of the- some, Could you raise your hand where- okay. Oh, yes. No? How would you apply what you just said to the interpretation of the uh, Constitution? Uh, 
I, I was drawn to this uh, conference because of panel two on interpretation, assuming that it might deal significantly with constitutional interpretation. Uh, I was also drawn uh, by the program for this to your recent article in the uh, New York Review of Books on Justice Sotomayor's confirmation. And uh, in that, you made a reference to genuine constitutional philosophy. Yes. Uh, during the course of the sessions here, uh, there have been references to constitutional interpretation, judicial review, which is not even mentioned in the Constitution. And one of the speakers made reference to Heller, uh, the Second Amendment case regarding rights and how that might be extended. Uh, we had in panel two Larry Solom, who has been involved with the evolution of originalism. I haven't heard the word originalism used by anyone. You did reference earlier uh, original intention, so I'm just wondering how originalism is uh, addressed in hedgehogs. <clears throat> in the, in the following way, I argue that originalism doesn't follow, as Justice Scalia has several times said it does, and Justice Thomas as well, from the very meaning of law or the very meaning of a constitution. To the degree to which we should aim to be faithful to something about the uh, we might call the intention of the people who wrote particular clauses, we need a justification for that fidelity. We need to say the way to be faithful to the document is to be faithful to some psychological state. I put it in that rather abstract way, some psychological state, because part of the question is what, what are we talking about? Are, there's an important distinction between what they meant to say and what they expected or hoped would be the result of their saying that. Uh, these are important distinctions, but the question of whether we should pay attention to some psychological state and which psychological state we should pay attention to, I believe are questions of political morality, rather complicated questions. Some people feel that they should be answered from a theory of democracy, but I think that only postpones the question but by uh, the question of what democracy properly understood is. So the important thing in the question you raised, the important thing is that that question, like all questions of constitutional interpretation, must be seen as a challenge in political morality and must be answered out of some theory of that sort. Exactly the kind of answer that Justice Scalia and Justice Scalia and Thomas don't ever give. I, at, uh, at some occasion, a few months ago, uh, I asked Justice Scalia whether he took any interest in political philosophy. Nah, was his answer. He said, I, st I studied this in college for a bit. Doesn't help. <laughs> well, <laughs> nah is as close as I can come to a direct <laughs> recapitulation. <laughs> I'd like to, to ask you a question about the passes from ethics to morality. Yes. Because you, you consider that each person should be free to, to choose what is the good life, what, what it is to, to live well. Yes. But you, 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 you seem not allowed that uh, what, what is well, what is good, 
is just the point of beginning ethics. So it has to be justified. I, I would allow, I would say, in an interpretive way, okay, but it, it has I'm, to be I'm enlarged, sorry, it I'm has not. to be justified. You are always allowed to ask why it is good, why it is well living. And if you don't do this, you never reach the point of morality. Oh. You, 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 you make a kind of, of, of painting like a Chinese black ink painting. You are not correcting, as in an oil painting. You are not correcting the departure. But the point of, 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 of ethics and, and is, is to go on, is to go on saying why it is good, why it is well. And in this way, you come to morality and you have to revise, perhaps entirely, your departure point. You are not allowed to make the painting as you reached at first. Mm. So how, how can you come with such a departure, arrive to, to morality as it is usually understood? Now, I'm, I, I, I fear I haven't, my fault, I haven't fully understood the question, but let me see if, if this is what you mean. Uh, that I, I talk about the importance of having a view about what it is to live well, but I don't offer much by way of help in answering that question. Yes. And I have to offer more before I can get any morality out of it. Is that right? Yes. yes. I, I would even say you, you have to offer everything. You have to offer the, all of it to justify entirely that well, is good. Well, let me answer that, the that question the as, of I, as I understood it. Uh, I, <laughs> I think there are, it makes sense to have a layered theory of what it is to live well. I believe that living well requires what I talk about in the book, which is self-respect and what I call authenticity. Now, I also say that one component of living well, generally, not always, is doing your best to have a good life. And that means thinking, what is a good life? But uh, I don't continue to give much by way of my own thoughts on that subject. Maybe I reveal a little bit by saying the value could be compared to uh, the value of a work of art. I, I take a, a certain very controversial ethical view in saying that, but I agree with you that I don't go very far in making explicit what a good life is. I th the question is whether I go far enough to provide a base for what I call the Kantian principle. And my view is, I may be wrong, but my view is that the first layer, the claim about self-respect and authenticity is enough to get started on defending the Kantian principle. I also have to say something to those who say, like Ed Baker, who say, well, but many people think that it's important how they live, but not important how anybody else live. And I, I've tried to say something about how implausible I find that. But that's all I do. I quite agree with you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I've enjoyed it so much that when Jim said had enough, I was almost tempted to say no. <laughs>